All right, this is uh, video number three for today. It's uh, Friday, September the 7th, 2012. And so what um, uh, what was the primary uh, conversation we were going to have on behalf of one of your clients? Yeah, I have a client who's presenting with a couple of things that, that touch on um, kind of three main topics that I've heard throughout the years from other folks as well. So I'll I'll give you her story first and then we can kind of branch off from there in, in multiple directions. So um, she's 69 years around the sun. Um, she's overweight, um, pre-diabetic. I believe that's a doctor's diagnosis. Um, but the big thing is that um, she's got atrial fibrillation and blood pressure concerns. And she is on medication prescribed by her doctor, which is the big kind of well, what do you do when you're already on medication? She's so on, atrial fibrillation, that means your regular heartbeat, I'm guessing, yep. would be Yeah, so the she's Latin. got medication to regulate her heartbeat and another medication to thin her blood. Yeah. Okay. And um, she, she found us as an alternative. She wants to, to find a more natural lifestyle change approach to upgrading our health. And she started taking chocolate bliss, uh, and I, you know, told her. Drink. Well, I bet that knocked her for a loop taking meds. Yeah, it did. <laughs> she loves it. She loves the taste of it, and she really is very committed to being on this journey. Um, however, what she experienced is that her blood pressure got higher. She had shortness of breath and some sleeplessness. Uh, and I said, well, hey, back off drink less bliss, drink at least as much water as you drink bliss. And, and now you've kind of reinformed that even more drink as much water before and after the amount of bliss that you have. Mm -hmm. um, and she also said that she was sensitive to caffeine um, even before she was diagnosed with this atrial fibrillation stuff. So she was concerned, like, is there caffeine in the cacao? How much is in there? And if that was causing her shortness of breath and the high blood pressure, um, since she backed off on the bliss and is doing smaller amounts every day, her blood pressure is um, fluctuating some, but it's a little more normalized. Mm -hmm. um, and she really feels like she just really needs to lose the weight in order to have everything kind of come back to stable um, right. and, and improve her health. But for me, that brought up um, kind of three important things that I've seen in several clients. Um, one is uh, a concern about caffeine and cacao. The second is the whole concept of blood pressure and how to manage high blood pressure. Mm -hmm. We get that even with people concerned about taking the sunflower salt. Um, and then the, the third is um, the, uh, with someone who's on medications, what do you do with that? Because all of a sudden you've got other kinds of side effects and interactions. I mean, this blood thinner and regulating heart rate thing, interacting with chocolate bliss, I'm not sure what that interaction is. And, Right. How do you manage that, no matter what medication you're on? Yeah, all right. So uh, those are the three biggies. So um, uh, I talk uh, a good bit about caffeine in a couple of recent recordings. One is uh, called, um, that I'm going to publish probably uh, right before I publish these that we've done today, that's called Curing the Candy Bar Effect. And also um, uh, Guarana Pricing and Evils. Yeah. Uh, that was a really good one. And some place or another, maybe in the conversation on um, the candy bar effect, I, I choose to know if that was where I talked about it or if it was some other recording. Let me just glance at my other recordings here I've got to do. Um, oh, uh, anyway, I, I choose to know where it is, but the, here's the bottom. I think it was in uh, curing the candy bar effect. Is The, the primary thing that um, you've really got to, to be focused on is... Um, uh, two really easy indicators to check are uh, pH and blood pressure. Uh -huh. And before you know, until you have your pH and blood pressure, and also sleep, that's another really easy one to check. Uh, until you've got those three worked out, uh, taking medications or having procedures, whether it's you know some sort of butchery or I mean surgery, <laughs> or um, you you know you see your uh, licensed pusher I mean doctor um, <laughs> or you you know you get your your treatment your radiation or chemotherapy or other wacky witch dockery you know it's just it's just a bunch of craziness so the first thing is if your pH is off yeah um, you know the, the likelihood of you doing anything putting anything additional in your body that can help unlikely almost anything you put in your body is going to hurt 
Right. And the way you check pH, you just go down to your local, you know, grocery store or, um, you know, that has a pharmacy or CVS or Walgreens or I don't know, whatever's in your local area. And just uh, go uh, to the pharmacy window and ask them for a roll of pH papers. Uh, you can usually get a roll of those for ten bucks. It'll last you, you know, probably the rest of your life. I mean, we, mm-hmm. you know, they, they they get old and and unusable before we actually go through them. Yeah. Because they we keep them around so long. So, uh, and and it's interesting that pH and blood pressure are going to be very tightly. They'll tightly correlate. Huh. In other words, they'll move up and down together. And the reason for that is that um, high blood pressure, low blood pressure is different. Uh, low blood pressure is if you think about a balloon, if you blow up a balloon, the typically like if you blow up a spaghetti balloon, it'll it'll start at the end and, and go out and inflate. And that's because as you put pressure, there's uh, there's a additional resistance against the wall of that that's causing the air to hold in the, the vessel or the passage. And so uh, low blood pressure is when you blow up a balloon, there's no rigidity in that wall. There's too little pressure and it, it just goes out. Mm. And that, that's a function of usually a deficiency of uh, correct essential fatty acids and uh, vitamin C and sulfur. Mm-hmm. So the components uh, that that make a thicker wall. Yeah, the, uh, basically the, the components that build collagen and um, uh, you know tissue. Right. So that that's low blood pressure. So now high blood pressure is completely different. It's very simple. Um, high blood pressure. I mean, taking. I mean, if you think through this, this is just stupid as a bag of hammers. If you're trying to, if you have a liquid, like if you if you compare oil and water together, water has a higher viscosity. It's thicker than water. Well, so if you'd like to make a fluid less viscous or thin it, what right. do you do? Bad you don't water. take drugs. For <laughs> God's sake, people, don't. If you're Here's a way to test your doctor. If you go to your doctor and say, I got high blood pressure, what do we do? Whoops. Um, and so if, if your doctor tells you, oh, we got to put you on blood thinners, he's incompetent. Fire him today. Fire, go a 180 and run away from him. He's a hack. He don't know jack. What he should tell you is, his, the first thing out of his mouth is not how much water are you drinking, what's your body weight, and how many ounces of water are you drinking a day. And this ain't like coffee and tea or even right. chocolate bliss or, or raw juice. No, 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 no. Water is water is water. Pure yeah. water with nothing else in it. So um, with my clients, I, I target in, immediately, for day one, is one ounce of water per pound of body weight per day. Yeah. So if you weigh 100 pounds, that's 100 ounces of water. And working up towards uh, closer to one and a half to two ounces of uh, water per pound per day. Yeah. So I weigh now about 170-ish or something like that, and I drink, you know, probably close to two gallons of water a day. I drink more water before in the morning before most people wake up than most people drink all day long. Right. So, you know, I usually start my day working out and have a, a, a liter or two of water, or a liter's a quart, so a, like a half a gallon of water. Yeah. And so the way that you fix your uh, blood pressure and you thin your blood is two things, and, the, and this will drive you crazy because this also surfaces how incompetent doctors are. The two things you require is salt and mm-hmm. water. Now here's the problem. If you go to a doctor and you got high blood pressure, what's the first thing they tell you? Don't have salt. Don't have salt. And right. you, and they're right, and I'm right. The problem yep. is the salt that they're talking about ain't true food-grade salt. Right. It's the crap you get at the grocery store. And crap, by the way, is a technical term that means continually reducing your attitude and performance. <laughs> crap food gives you a crap life, period. Yep. So if you'd like to have a crap life, you eat crap food. If you'd like to have an immaculate life, you eat, you know, natural state, pristine, immaculate food. It's just that simple. And so the problem is that the doctors are telling you the truth. You should never put what passes for salt in a grocery store. You should never let that stuff pass your lips, ever. Um, because it's got all sorts of uh, chemical processing and it's been burnt at several thousand degrees it's just it's 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 no longer a fit substance to ingest as food right and so when when melissa and i are talking about salt we're talking about 
some this fire stuff salt. here, like sunfire salt. If you can see that, I mean that's it's a it's a very uh, rose colored salt. And then here's another problem. Like okay, well okay, so you know the sunfire salt looks like pink salt. I'm going to go to the supermarket and buy some random pink salt off the you know out of the bulk bins or off the shelf. No, that's not good either. Here's why. We used to be the largest retailer, or one of the largest retailers, of a particular brand of pink salt, which we will not name. They are, they are um, one of the primary importers of pink salt. Problem was that we assayed their salt. Now, assay means to, to get a chemical analysis of a, um, a substance. Right. And what we found was the levels of nickel in our salt that we were selling our clients as a health food was uh, far, far exceeded the OSHA acceptable standards. And, and OSHA acceptable standards means that OSHA is the governing body for manufacturing plants. They protect uh, people from being exposed to harmful chemicals. Right. So every manufacturing plant, every company has OSHA standards. And if you're working in a plant that has any type of uh, uh, nickel, for example, there are standards that you're only allowed to be exposed to so many uh, so much uh, ppm particles per million of nickel per day and the levels of nickel in this salt were so astronomically high that that was the last day i ever put that in my mouth wow we didn't even, a lot of times if we, we if we find a, a product that is uh, less immaculate than uh, what we uh, are you know willing to sell our customers we'll put it on our garden or, or we'll actually sell it, you know, uh, in some other aftermarket, especially if we got, you know, like, you know, pallets or, or 20 foot containers of the, the stuff. You got to do something with it. Wow. Uh, this we were I was unwilling to sell. Yeah. So we just put it on our garden. And also the other thing uh, just in, in mentioning since we're talking about salt, the other thing is this uh, this uh, uh, evil gray salt stuff that gets sold as health food. And some of it I've seen as high as $25, 30 a pound. Wow. And I, 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 I'm going to tell you this right now. <laughs> salt, it, there is no uh, uh, gray. Well, there are some mineral salts that are grayish. Uh, that is not the gray salt that gets uh, imported from France and sold as gray salt. The gray in that salt, so if you think about where the salt is harvested, it's harvested in, in, Bright, in the Brighton area of France. And okay. I won't mention any trade names, but, you know, it's most of the gray salt that you see in the supermarket. And if you go and uh, look at where that Brighton Beach is, it's right in the English Channel, which is one of the most polluted areas of the world. So guess what that gray is? Ew. It's oil. Ew. It is Pollution petroleum oil. residue. Wow. Stuff that's leaking out of boats, leaking out of uh, offshore drilling platforms. In fact, a couple of years ago, the French salt ministry, there was so much uh, oil in the salt that they were afraid people were going to start uh, having health challenges. And they stopped the export of gray salt for around nine months. Wow. Yeah, and, that, oh, and that also coincided with a big oil spill they had there, too. Wow. So, you know, then your gray salt would have been black, and that would have been no yeah. good, right? Yeah. So, you know, rule of thumb is gray salt, not fit for consumption. Pink salt is not fit for consumption uh, unless you uh, uh, check it out. Here's how you check it out, and this is the way we found our source. You call up the people you're buying pink salt from, and here's the question, and this is the only question. If you ask any other question, they'll uh, know what you're after. What you ask them for is the, uh, the manufacturer and the model number of the grinder where they <laughs> grind their salt and the exact location where they get their salt from. And what does the manufacturer model number of the grinder tell you? Oh, well, that tells you, uh, you know, every I've only found one uh, salt vendor that uh, one salt broker that could give me the information. What that basically tells you is that the people you're working with ain't got a clue where their stuff comes from, where their right. uh, product comes from. And I called around for a better part of a year, a year and a half before I could find somebody that could answer that question. And I ended up getting actually the owner of, of this uh, brokerage firm on the phone. It was really early in the morning. And she rattled off the manufacturer and model number of the grinder. And I'm like, now, wait a minute. How do you know that yeah. that's really the manufacturer model number of the grinder used? She said, that's simple. All the grinders, and I'm going to get to why this is important, all the grinders uh, in uh, that area of the world are made of nickel, uh -huh. and we couldn't find one made of anything else, so we bought one 
and shipped it over there. A wow. stainless grinder we bought, and we that's a that's a captive source that we grind all our salt there, and yeah. so that's where we get our salt is ground on the grinder we sh- shipped over there. And here's why it's important: the nickel in that salt. Like if I like when I did this assay and ended up with all this nickel, which is far more toxic than uh, mercury that people are having fillings taken out of their mouth. Wow. I, you know, I'm like I get this assay back, and I'm like, well. You know, if I look at the assays of the, you know, the global topography maps, I see there ain't no nickel in that area of the world. So right. where in the world is this nickel coming from that's in my salt? Yeah. And it's from the grinders because if you take soft nickel and you grind those grinders against hard rock, in other words, salt is harder than nickel, guess what you get? Yeah. The salt actually grinds the grinder. So rule of thumb is you got to be really careful when you're buying salt because most pink salt and most uh, uh, gray salt is unfit for human consumption. And, you know, this is the stuff that you don't think about. You know, you go into black hole foods, which is a generic term, not meaning to specifically talk about any um, uh, company that's that's, uh, located, uh, you know, their headquarters is in downtown Austin, Not not meaning to mention that it's any particular company. Uh, if you go to some sort of black hole foods, uh, uh, you know, supposedly health food store, the problem is you walk in, you're surrounded by these big, huge, you know, this like, uh, you know, it's like a coliseum or a, a, um, a temple to the, the gods of processed food. The problem is you walk in there and you think because you're in a grocery store, there's some groceries in there. No. You know, 99% of it's toxic sludge. It's just, you know, yeah. you'd be better off going to 7-Eleven. The only difference is the 7-Eleven stuff is usually older. <laughs> you know, they take, like, on the potato chip bags, they take and, and use alcohol to wash off the expiration date and put a new one on and oh, get to 7-Eleven. Yeah. I don't know if you knew that or not. That Some guy told me that, lot. yeah. Yeah, when the stuff expires at HEB, we wipe it off with alcohol and put a new stamp on it and go sell it to 7-Eleven. Wow. Anyway, so... um. Uh, that we've probably talked enough about um, uh, salt, and and just to wrap up, the reason salt's important is that salt is the substance that allows you to hold water in your body. So if your doctor tells you don't eat salt, guess what's ha- guess what happens? It doesn't really matter how much water you drink; you'll never be able to get into yeah. your cells. You're just gonna pee it out. Yeah, and so you'll get you'll get further and further dehydrated, which is great for the doctor because you're going to get sicker and sicker, and you'll need more, uh, you know, butchery and therapy. Yeah. I mean, uh, surgery and um, uh, medications. Right. Uh, so uh, you know, it's it's knives and drugs. So and, the important thing is you got to you know have high quality salt and high quality water. Start with an ounce uh, per pound of body weight per day. Uh, work up towards two. And in t- and that will also help balance your pH too. Cool. Uh, and so you know once your pH is balanced and your uh, blood pressure comes down, then you start looking at other stuff. So that means right. you can get rid of your blood pressure meds too, which um, that was the, like the like the first thing was blood pressure, which we talked about. Uh, right. Next thing we'll just touch on medications. Yeah. For God's sake, don't stop taking your medications today. I'm telling you that I'm going to say that again. If you are taking medications, the the only way you should come off those things is either working with your doctor, mm-hmm. or if they tell you, well, you got to take those for life, they're incompetent. So fire them. Fine. Find another doctor. <laughs> uh, find another doctor, and usually, uh, what's called a compounding pharmacist mm-hmm. is uh, far better to use for coming off of meds than a doctor because a compounding pharmacist is basically a a compounding pharmacist is a pharmacist that takes um, uh, individual components and grinds those up in specific right. ratios and then maybe even uh, creates the capsules there on the premises for you based specifically on your individual unique uh, requirements. They know far more about drug interactions and most importantly how to get off of drugs you don't need to be on that usually than your far, than your doctor ever will. Right. How do you how do you find a compounding pharmacist and get oh, time with man. them to to do a consult like that? I mean, are are they the same as a pharmacist at your local drugstore? Probably not. Uh, you're probably going to have to go um, to a much more specialized type of pharmacist. You might just look in the yellow pages or do a Google online for compounding pharmacist. Right. And you and you the way that you can. Um, 
interview pharmacies to find someone like this is you can just call them up and say, look, uh, I'm looking for a compounding pharmacist. Do you guys do that or is there someone you can recommend? Right. Uh, another question that you might ask is, um, you know, I'm on, uh, you know, 83 medications and I'd like to prioritize these as, you know, which ones I come off of in which order and I'd like to get it down to zero. Can you help me? Right. And if they say, you know, possibly, yes, come in yeah. and we'll talk to you. If they say, oh, I can't do that, then, you know, move on. Right. Um, awesome. So, you know, that's the... Uh, and, and while you're on medications and, and working your way off of them, do you find that there's often complications with superfoods? Because yeah. Because they can be fact, slightly medicinal? Yeah. In fact, well, uh, let me just wrap up on medications and we'll okay. talk about the interaction with superfoods. So the problem with just cold turkey coming off medications is that you may end up in a world of hurt, especially right. if it has anything to do with... Um, uh, you, something that you've been taking for a long, long period of time, especially if it messes around with your neurochemistry, like um, uh, an SSRI or a, some kind of mal inhibitor, you know, any, anything that's messing around with your blood chemistry or hormones, if you right. just stop taking that, usually you will rue the day you were born. So I'm telling you again, medications especially strong medications that have been taken over long periods of time have to be you've got to wean yourself off that yeah that's just like methamphetamines or heroin which by the way i saw this study interesting statistic uh this was a study done that estimated uh the increase in drug use uh in the uh the decade of the 90s uh-huh so 1990 to 1990 or 1990 to 2000 and during that time, uh, uh, the statistics um, showed that the amount of illicit street use um, uh, chemical dependency had increased. In other words, people becoming addicted to illegal drugs, criminally right. uh, scheduled drugs, uh, had gone up around 30 percent. And during that same period, the increase in people addicted to uh, doctor prescribed medications had gone up over 300 percent. Wow. So you're way better off if you need some drugs to feel good, go find the local pusher selling crack on the corner. It's way better than going to your doctor. Or or don't do them and have chocolate as yeah, your Yeah, and we'll food. get to that in a minute. In fact, what's really interesting, um, I don't know if you knew that Yamaya uh, had a, uh, she actually fell in a, uh, a uh, grocery store and broke her arm. No. Anyway, so it was interesting to me that um, the way that we manage pain is, you know, we have internal processes that we manage pain. Right. And, you know, the first thing that the EMT guys were pushing were drugs, 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 yeah. drugs. And what they were pushing was like laudanum and um, uh, what was it like? Uh, not Demerol, but they were, they were all basically synthetic opiates that made uh, heroin look like a toy. Wow. So they're pushing, uh, they're pushing scripts on my wife to get her addicted to painkillers, so she's in the system. Then From we get a broken to the, arm. I mean, yeah. I broke my arm as a kid. They didn't give me any stuff like that. And then, and then they, you know, to to keep badgering her to take these drugs, they tried to get her to take a ride in the ambulance. Which, by the way, I found out later, this is like two thousand dollars to ride five miles in the ambulance, Jeez. and we refused. Because there wasn't no way that I was going to let these quack EMS guys try to push drugs on my wife while she's in an altered state from having an injury. Yeah. Then we get to the uh, hospital, and, and every stage of the process we went through to get her uh, arm splinted, they're pushing drugs. Wow. So rule of thumb is the, um, the, the most uh, institutionalized uh, drug-pushing machine on the planet is Big Pharma and your local uh, general practitioner doctor. Yeah. So anyway, that's uh, I'm, I'm pretty wrapped up on that. Um, I better get off my soapbox. So, I was going to say, that's a good soapbox for you to be on. Yeah, so uh, uh, interactions between superfoods and medications. Here's yeah. how this works. Um, uh, and this is actually, we'll say, uh, a better way of saying this is probably superfoods interacting with anything that's a downscale substance. I like that. Yeah, so for example, like if you take our chocolate bliss and you think, oh, I'm going to save a few pennies and go um, buy some uh, agave nectar at the store instead of using Sunfire Superfoods, I've had lots of people tell me, well, I can't drink your chocolate bliss because whenever I make it, it upsets my stomach. I get, you know, I get burning sensations and I get all sorts of gas and I feel nauseous. 
And I'm like, well, tell me how you're making it. Are you you're using chocolate bliss and our vanilla agave and our toka? Oh no no, we're using like uh, you know some sort of you know whey protein, or we bought oh. we bought uh, you know some kind of agave nectar off the shelf at uh, some you know grocery corner grocery store. So yeah. here's the way superfoods work. If you ingest a high quality food with a low quality food, the high quality food will it's like a knockdown drag out cage match the superfood it's the superfood cage match the superfood will start you know it will it will freaking take out the low grade food and cool. because that low grade food is mixed in your stomach at the same time the easiest way to take that out is throwing it Don't. back up you need it in the first place. Yeah. Right. So, you know, a rule of thumb is you know the quality of foods. If you mix something with chocolate bliss and it makes you feel sick, then, you know, maybe you ought to try just using, you know, stuff from us and to start with as a baseline. And then you, you know, work out the, the rest of your um, uh, experiments from there. Right. Uh, so the same way with medications, if you're taking some kind of medication and you ingest superfoods along with that medication, you can end up in a world of hurt. So here's the way you do it and you and to keep from hurting okay. is never, ever, 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 ever take medications when you have uh, superfoods. You've just recently ingested superfoods. Don't take your superfoods before medications or after. So, what so not at the same time of day is what you mean. Right. So what you're looking for is you're, you're looking for like when you take like there's stages of digestion. When you pop a pill, it's going to go into your stomach. And at the bottom of your stomach is your pyloric valve. Right. And so you've got, the, you know, for, for when you're when you've digested enough, your pyloric valve will drop and the stuff will go out and the pyloric valve will close. Right. And you'll be in your small intestine. And it'll wrap around in there until it goes down to the curve of your large intestine. That's called the ileocecal valve. The ileocecal valve will open and it'll go in. Your appendix is down here. The ileocecal valve will, will allow it to go through and then it'll close. And so what you've got to do, you know, if, if for example, you've got uh, superfood stuff, especially in your, uh, you, say you've drunk a, a quart of chocolate bliss and it's dropped out of your stomach and it's in your small intestine and you eat, you know, some kind of prescription medication and that drops out of your pylorus down into that superfood brew, it's, mm. it's cage match time. I'm telling you, and it'll just be a knockdown, you know, like a, you know, UFC or uh, what's the WWF? Or, I mean, you know, those big guys that are jumping. MMA, off. mixed martial arts. Yeah, MMA, <laughs> WWF. I mean, if you'd like to have some pain, then that's what you do. So, how do you know how long to wait for the superfood brew to make it down to the lower intestine before you take the medication? Well, so the uh, it's a little bit. Uh, you know, it's going to be a little bit different depending on everything you you eat and drink. Like for me, uh, pretty much the only thing, like it's twelve thirty right now, and I've been up since probably about five thirty. The only thing I've had is water and chocolate bliss. Mm -hmm. And whenever I drink chocolate bliss, it's so um, you know there's nothing else in my system, and the chocolate bliss basically requires very little uh, digestion, so it drops out of my stomach into my small intestine and everything gets absorbed and nothing's left but water and then that goes into my kidneys and the rest drops out into my elimination. And so if I were to take some kind of medication, I, you know, I could probably wait for an hour after I'd had some chocolate bliss and it wouldn't have any effect. Because uh, you don't if, have anything else yeah. for it to oh, move and through. The other thing too is like if you eat, eat like if you know, you eat uh, like a, some sort of fast food stuff that's going to take, you know, 10 or 20 hours to digest and you dump superfood blend on top of that or raw juice or anything upscale it's cage match time again right um uh so you know if you eat a big meal uh you know you pretty much you better you're better off uh you know steering clear of any type of uh superfood or uh, raw juice until the next day now a simple way to um cover over a multitude of sins is just carry a pocket full of uh our primal digest uh, enzymes yeah. with you and just you know take those with your meal and the heavier the meal the more you take a rule of thumb is you know how much enzymes to take to uh, you take as many as required to avoid food coma so right. that might be one if you're you know eating an avocado or it might be it might be four or five if you're eating a, you know a five course six course uh, french meal right yeah that has lots of fats and burnt stuff in it cooked uh, processed stuff so, um, 
All right. That's so, pretty awesome. I like it. So, I mean, I can imagine someone with, who's desiring to come off of medications to just separate the day, you know, have, have your chocolate bliss in the morning with your water and try to, if you can delay the medications till the evening and eat, eat raw and superfoods during the day as much as yep. you can. And that'll be the faster upgrade. Yeah. You know, there's really so, something really important about medications too, is to is a lot of people I'll ask them, they'll bring me like, well, it used to be when I ran a client practice, they'd bring me like a, the, you know, 40 bottles of stuff they're taking. And I would just randomly pick one and say, okay, here's the name of this thing. Uh, why are you taking it? And they didn't have a clue. So here's yeah. another thing you got to ask your doctor is, why am I taking this? Yeah. And how do I get off it? And if the doctor can't tell you exactly why, and it better darn well be keeping you alive. If they say, well, it's like a prophylactic where, you know, you're taking that to maybe keep from this thing happening 20 years from now. You better fire that stupid per I mean, you got to fire that person right then and get yeah. out. Right. Yeah. yeah. Never, never take anything that's uh, prophylactic. You know, in other words, prophylactic means that you're protecting against some situation that may someday occur somehow. Maybe. Wow. You know. Anyway, probably when the sun goes nova. In other words, never. Uh, so let's. <laughs> All right. See. So the uh, last bit is caffeine. Caffeine. Yeah. So um, uh, again, I talk about this as I cover this a lot in the um, uh, those two recordings, curing the candy bar effect and the stuff about uh, guarana. Uh, the simple way to think about caffeine is that, and actually any type of, if you notice any type of the strong adaptogen, the really um, powerful medicines that people have used over the years, which would include. Um, uh, chocolate, uh, guarana, which is actually huarana, uh, yerba mate, uh, ma huang, which is uh, what a fedra is distilled from, uh, and a few other. Uh, uh, cola is really hard to work with, so we don't work with it because cola is such a hard um, nut that it has to really be ground, and it, there's really no way to there's really no way to process a cola or a coffee bean. To create a raw sort of low temperature processed uh, substance right. so we tend to steer clear of those anyway the, the the primary commonality that all these really strong powerful medicinal foods have is caffeine now why is that well because caffeine can be very beneficial if it's in the correct state so for example uh, caffeine and chocolate we'll just talk about chocolate for a minute so uh, caffeine and chocolate when you start with the green the bean it, when it's in its immature state the the total sum of caffeine is in the bean okay if you eat a green cacao bean or an unfermented bean even if it's ripe and unfermented right you will be tripping <laughs> it, it you'll, is you'll some, be high on caffeine yeah in fact <laughs> i read some book here recently that says you know for a for a, for a wonderful experience with your lover, eat 60 cacao beans and get a candlelight lit pool. Oh my God, if I eat 60 green cacao beans, I'd freaking be up for two months. Don't do that. I, well, I'd be I wouldn't cleaning the house that. five times over. <laughs> yeah, so, um, so when, when cacao beans are fully fermented, um, what happens is the caffeine begins to, to uh, it, it goes through a metabolic process Fermentation is where you've got microorganisms that uh, feed on the the uh, the sugars of a substance until those sugars are gone, and then the mic the microbes die. Uh -huh. And so uh, it's you know it's the same way whether you're making sauerkraut or anything. If you ferment something long enough, then all the microbes die. Right. In sauerkraut, for example, you just eat them when the cultures are alive because they're beneficial. If right. you eat a fermenting ca cacao bean, those microorganisms aren't so beneficial. Uh, which also brings up a point. If you go to the bulk bins in your local Black Hole Foods, uh, or you know, not meaning to mention any names of e name. evil conglomerates <laughs> that uh, base themselves in Texas and Austin. Anyway, um, if you go into a uh, any kind of uh, store and you or you open a bag of cacao or you stick your head in a bulk bin and it smells like fungus, it is. Don't eat that. Right. Just steer clear. Um, you know, there's a reason they're selling that cacao for two dollars a pound, and we sell ours for whatever we do. I other than even know it's probably twenty or thirty bucks a pound or more. Yeah. And so, um, when when a cacao bean ferments, the process is this: all the caca the caffeine starts in the bean, right. and as the microorganisms work on that material, um, they digest the sugar, and they also 
Um, it's a little bit unclear whether it's the microorganisms or it's just the process of the microbes in conjunction with the ripening of the bean. What happens though is the caffeine begins to separate and change and there's two forms of caffeine at the end of this process. One form is in the bean. That's okay. very uh, instru that's very beneficial and it's adaptogenic, which we'll talk about in a minute. The other form is in the shell, which is highly stimulating, more like methamphetamines. So what we do is we uh, we take the beans and we crack them slightly. They're they're broken in pieces, and then we right. blow the shell off before it goes to the press to be pressed into um, to be. Uh, we separate it with a press to press out the oil so that the powder is left. Right. And so um, the um, uh, the shell is blown off, and uh -huh. the uh, primary. Um, uh, the majority of the caffeine is in the shell, so that's gone. Right. Well, the residual caffeine in the bean now is very adaptogenic. Now, adaptogenics, adaptogens, here's the way they work. Um, they, they track the serotonin cycle. So our, our bodies have serotonin that tracks the sun. And so yeah. as the sun starts on the horizon in the morning and starts moving towards its zenith, the tie point, then our, our serotonin says, okay, we're in activity mode. So we're ramping up in our activity. And the, in fact, at the sun zenith, the oriental technologies say that our digestive fire and adrenal fire and kidney fire is at its highest point. I mean, that's, uh, I'd, I'd have to go back and look at kidney fire. I, I suspect that uh, adrenal, thyroid, kidney, all the organ fire is probably at its highest point. Uh, I know the digestive fire, that's the the uh, highest point. So they say to, you know, to eat the things that require the most energy digesting when your digestive fire is the highest. So high noon. Right, so high <laughs> noon. So as the sun comes up, adaptogens will help support and uh, build up your energy. As the sun begins to go down, those same adaptogens will allow us to go into a deeper and deeper rest mode. Mm -hmm. And so, for example, you can tell the quality of chocolate or guaran or anything by taking some before you go to sleep. And if you end up on the ceiling for three days, that stuff is, that's what we call uh, garden superfoods. Those go on your garden, on your mouth. Right. <laughs> In fact, for years, I refused to carry any adaptogens because they were just, um, I couldn't get any, I'd never been exposed to any that were um, high quality. So my first exposure was a person saying to me, no, 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 you're confused. Here's the, it's, she, she explained how adaptogens work. I'm going to send you some samples, and here's what I'd like you to do. Is I'd like you to take a teaspoon of guarana in water right before you go to bed. I'm like, uh -huh. ain't no way I'm going to do that. I'll be up for three days. She said, no, 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 trust me, take it. I took that, and bang, fell right to sleep. Wow. And so now I usually take... Um, uh, you know, I, I use the Jungle Bliss recipe right now for making my chocolate bliss, and I usually drink... I don't know, four, six, eight ounces of that before I go to sleep, or you know, half an hour to hour before I go to sleep, and it really deepens my sleep. Cool. So, so awesome. that was uh, we talked about blood pressure, uh, pH, salt water was the first thing, and then medications and caffeine. Yep. Did we cover everything on your list there? I think so. Um, I have one question about the the adaptogenic that's left, the adaptogenic caffeine that's left in the bean after mm -hmm. your process. Is that theobromine then? That's like yeah. related to caffeine but different. Yeah, it's. I mean, no, there's all sorts of people that make up stories. The actual technical term of the substance is theobromine or bromine. Okay. Your yeah. And also, just to wrap up on that, uh, also the uh, if you listen to the talk that I short talk I did about guarana, the pricing and evils. Right. Um, most guarana typically is boiled sometimes for two three months. Wow. That what the what the local uh, Aboriginal people do is they they keep this pot boiling, and they just throw more and more guarana in there, and basically it, it it's a way that uh, it just distills guarana into this very. I mean, you can see it like if you see uh, if you watch uh, Natural Geographic uh, shows where they're like walking through markets in South America, you'll see these. They look like cottonseed cake. I don't uh -huh. know if you know what that is, but it's like. It's like a cylinder about the size of a quarter to a half dollar. These long extruded um, cylinders that look like roots hanging in shop uh, stalls. Right. And what that is, is guarana that has been boiled down and extruded into this. I mean, it's hard as a rock. Wow. And they just break it off and sell it by the inch. Wow. And, you know, an inch of guarana, I mean, that stuff will put you on the freaking moon, baby. You'd be, you'd be riding high. 
it's great for entertainment value. As for a uh, you know uh, a longevity and food enhancement, no, right. uh, that's a, that's a wrong kind. You know, every, uh, the guarana we have is 100% guarana. There's no maltodextrin. There's no caramel coloring. Uh, there's as little heat as possible, and there's certainly no boiling for months and months. Yeah. Yeah. And then, of course, if you take your grana or your cacao and you overheat it, then you're going to have that same stimulant. Yeah. I mean, to, an, to a certain extent, you won't be able to, to burn it as much as a chemical processing plant. But, you know, if you... Right. You know, if you bake with it or, you know, burn it like, you know, mix it with sugar and make some sort of caramelized chocolate thing, then, you know, you're going to end up losing a lot of the nutrients will evaporate and and what's right. left will burn or denature. So the molecular, the space between the the molecules is there's less space. They're just fused together. Mm. If you burn something, sugar is a good um, uh, example. If you take liquid sh- or uh, pow- uh, white crystalline sugar and you throw right. it in a pan and you burn it, it turns into a caramelized uh, sugar. Yep. And if you let that uh, cool, it, I mean, it turns into, it's hard as a rock. Yeah. And I, you know, that's a much, it's much harder to digest caramelized sugar than white sugar. It's much harder to digest white sugar than, you know, the, the juice that you suck out of a sugar cane right. uh, stock. So, you know, every, everything, you know, the more and more processing, the harder and harder that it is to digest and the less and less nutrients it has in it. So Cool. cool. All right. Well, I feel like we've got more impairment. I mean, I know I, I ask you a lot of the same things and we get you to repeat yourself a lot, but it's always with a new context and, and somehow we keep getting new information out of you. Like I really like cool. this concept of the watch your pH and your blood pressure and your sleep first. It makes yep. a lot of sense. Yeah, in fact, the uh, sleep uh, we'll we'll just wrap up on that and I've got a I've got another uh, video that I'm going to publish here that's um just about sleep so you guys can go and look on our um video channel for that. Uh, the thing about sleep is that that's where cellular regeneration and also that's where we do memory consolidation where we convert uh, information experience that we've had all during the day into um, knowledge and then eventually knowledge turns into wisdom and so if you are constantly having interrupted sleep you get no cellular regeneration oh and by the way that's also where the that's also the time when the majority of neurotransmitters and hormones are produced Wow it's not when you're up running around running your errands or going to work or you know up during the day no it's at night when your body is quiesced or dormant and then you can go through all those metabolic processes to generate your neurotransmitters hormones um, do your um, cellular regeneration and do your memory consolidation information into memory awesome so you know that's um, uh, you yeah, know, we you do got a lot of work issues, in our sleep pardon me we do a lot of work in our sleep. Oh, you betcha. Yeah, in fact, sleep is very important. So if you, you know, fix your pH, uh, fix your blood pressure, fix your sleep, and until you do those three things, uh, really, there's nothing else to look at. And then the, probably the fourth really good thing, that's a pretty good uh, list there. Yeah. The fourth thing is to keep in mind, here's the way that you know uh, the quality of what you're eating. You know how well you're nourished by the number of hours you forget to eat. Yeah. So if you are always, if you wake up hungry, you're hungry all day, you go to sleep hungry, you wake up the middle of the night hungry, what you're eating ain't food for you. It might be food for somebody else, it ain't food for you. So like I said, it's, you know, one o'clock now. And the only thing I've had for the past, uh, let's see, so six, seven, eight, probably eight hours now, I've had maybe a quart to a quart and a half of chocolate bliss and, um, a considerable amount of water. That's yeah. it. But that that also assumes that your systems are all functioning well, which yours are. Mm-hmm. So someone who's in the middle of a detox might have the same amount of chocolate bliss to you and be hungry because they've got biofilm on their digestive tract or yeah. other things that are complicating it getting through. And the easy way to fix that is to make sure you're drinking uh, equal amounts of water. So you start with, you always start with, like if you're going to have a, a uh, big glass of chocolate bliss like I've, I've got my my big blue glass with stars nice. on it that's the proper way to drink chocolate bliss is with a glass with stars on it <laughs> we are stardust anyway uh, so you know before you drink this much chocolate bliss you start with that much water yeah All right so first you drink your water you wait 10 15 minutes then you have that much chocolate bliss 
and then before you have another glass of chocolate bliss you drink that much water again like i've got a you know a container of water here too yeah. So, you know, as and, I'm and even if you're not going to have another glass of chocolate bliss, have that much water again anyway. Yeah. 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 You bet. So and if you have challenges uh, wondering about how much water you're getting, figure out your body weight. So, you know, if you weigh 100 pounds, uh, you know, figure out how many quarts. That's uh, what uh, there's uh, 32 ounces. Uh, so that would be about three and a half, say four quarts. So you take four quart mason jars, you fill them up with water, set them out on your kitchen counter. That's what yep. you've got to drink before the sun goes down. Yeah. Right. Simple. I mean, this ain't rocket science, right? Yeah. So, um, awesome. Yep. Thanks, David. Really cool. appreciate you and well, your wealth of wisdom. You must have been sleeping well, integrating all that knowledge and yes, wisdom. Yes, I've, I've been, uh, I've been uh, sleeping deep and continuous and integrating my, uh, consolidating my memories. <laughs> awesome. Awesome. Thanks. Take care. <laughs> <laughs> <laughs>